Um, so Michelle Kim is going to be first. I will tell you a little bit about Michelle. She is a Vancouver-based novelist, filmmaker, and actor. She's a former journalist for the BBC and CBC. Michelle has acted in and produced various feature films. Her directorial debut was uh, The Tree Inside, which played at various film festivals around the world and won Audience Choice Awards at the Vancouver Asian Film Festival and the Northwest Filmmakers Festival in Portland. Running Through Sprinklers is her first book, and she will now read from it. Uh, thank you so much. I'll just tell you a little bit about it first. It's, uh, this story is told through the eyes of 12-year-old Sarah, who is half Korean, and it's about her friendship with the girl across the street who is half Japanese, and it's set in Surrey, BC. Nadine and I are at my house playing with Cookie, my hamster. We put him in his plastic ball and let him run around the downstairs of my house. I got Cookie more than three years ago, in grade three, after my orthodontist appointment one day. This happened after spending most of the summer trying to convince mom it was a good idea. I remember how I begged, please mom, I've never had a pet before. Why do you want a rat? They're so dirty. I don't understand, she said. Me, it's not a rat, it's a hamster. They're small and cute and they don't have those long tails. She actually looked slightly thoughtful. She, ha she said hesitantly, just how long are their tails? No longer than a centimeter, I swear. And when will it die? In two years, I promise. <laughs> it's now past the two-year death wish, and my hamster is still going strong. He's almost four years old. I'm not kidding. He's even got gray hair and survived a stroke. <laughs> but I think the reason my hamster lived so long is because when I first got him, my mom was too freaked out to let him in the house, so she banned the cage to the garage. Cookie spent the first year inhaling the fumes of my mom's stinky Chinese medicine that she cooked on a little camping stove <coughs> in the middle of the garage. <coughs> in the garage at night, the pot simmers on low. My hamster runs on his wheel, then he gets off, goes in the middle of the cage. He stands up on his hind legs, sniffing in the air and breathing in the medicine. Slowly, my hamster becomes super hamster. <laughs> Cookie is so smart, and he's getting more so with age. We put him in his little plastic ball, and he runs all around the house in it. Then when we want him to appear, all we have to say is, Cookie, come here, and he does. A, a small plastic ball spinning towards us, his little teddy bear face inside. On the weekend during the school year, while I do my homework, I put Cookie in my left koala slipper to sleep. I even lay down one of mom's maxi pads just in case he pees, but he never does. He's the best hamster ever. Anyway, it's Friday night. It's, it's sleepover night and at Nadine's house, but we're at my house now. Nadine, can we eat here, then go to my house? My mom's making meatloaf. For the record, I actually like her meatloaf, but I think you always like someone else's mom's food. Okay, I say, let's eat here. Mom from downstairs, I'll make you bibimbap. Us, hooray. In a bowl, st steamed white rice. Different kites and namul on it, spinach, thinly sliced carrots, radish, spicy bean sprouts, beef, and fried egg. I mush it up all together, a rainbow in my bowl. I'll end there. Thank you. <laughs> nice. Thank you, Michelle. Um, next up is Chuck Kwan. Chuck was born in Hong Kong and grew up in Singapore and Japan. After studying engineering in the US, he immigrated to Canada in 1976, where he embarked upon a successful IT career. In 1978, Chuck founded, co-founded the Asian Nadian, a progressive and influential magazine dedicated to the promotion, promotion of Asian Canadian arts, culture, and politics. The following year, Mr. Kwan helped lead the anti-W5 campaign to fight against the racist portrayal of Chinese Canadians in the media. 
Mr. Kwan's dias diasporic life inspired him to produce and direct the Chinese restaurant documentary series. Yeah, I saw that. That was really good. Um, he is the executive director at Harmony Movement. Please welcome Mr. Chuck Kwan. Uh, I, ha I have to blame Alan for this. I asked him yesterday, do I have to prepare for anything? He said, no, 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 just show up. <laughs> so I, I didn't bring anything, uh, which is a good thing because I'm not, I'm not a writer and I'll be embarrassed to be uh, sitting here with reading my, my, uh, the memoir I'm trying to write. But um, let me just tell you why I'm here because I have to justify myself. <laughs> uh, Jim Wong Chun invited me here two years ago um, because he told me I, I, I'm, I'm a storyteller, so by virtue of my um, Chinese restaurants uh, series. Uh, and I agree with him, and because in French there's a word called cameras de l'eau, which means writing with pen, uh, um, writing with a camera. So in that sense, I, I, I guess I qualify as a writer. Uh, what I'm doing right now is basically um, trying to write a book about um, what I've went through with my 15 stories of my Chinese restaurant's owner, um, and uh, one, per, one for chapter. And some of you might have heard uh, in the first panel you know, on Friday that I read from my Argentina chapter. And I was going to read from my Cuba chapter, except that Alan says, no, 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 don't worry. You don't have to do anything. <laughs> so I'm not doing anything. Thank you. <laughs> Getting off that lightly. We have many <laughs> questions for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, next is um, Evelyn Lau. Everybody probably knows Evelyn. She is the Vancouver author of 12 books, including seven volumes of poetry. Her first book, Runaway, Diary of a Street Kid, published when she was just 18, was a Canadian bestseller and made into a CBC movie starring Sandra Oh. You might have heard of Sandra Oh. Evelyn's uh, short stories, essays, and novellas have been translated into a dozen languages. Her poetry has received the Milton Acorn Award, the Pat Lowther Award, a National Magazine Award, and nominations for the BC Book Prize and the Governor General's Award. From 2011 to 2014, Evelyn served as Vancouver's Poet Laureate. She has also served as writer in residence at UBC, Kwantlen, and Vancouver Community College, as well as di distinguished Writing, visiting writer at the University of Calgary. Evelyn's most recent collection is Tumor. We are honored to have Evelyn here today. Thank you, Julia. Um, I think we all need to publish more books so that our intros get longer and longer, and then we don't actually have to do any reading, because the intros will take up the whole hour and a half. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I chose two poems to read from my latest collection, and um, the reason I chose these poems is partly because of Jim Wong Chu, whose memory, of course, permeates this whole festival. Um, we used to sometimes butt heads about the whole idea of writing about um, Chinese heritage, and I've always been on the side of the fact that we write what we need to write, what we feel is urgent and necessary, and that there, isn't, there shouldn't be any obligation to write about Chinese, our Chinese background, if we're Chinese, if that's not um, what feels important to us, or if that's not um, you know, what's, what's at the top of my, our minds at any, you know, at any time. Um, so it's really taken me a long time to get to that point where I have had more interest in writing about Chinatown and write, writing about my family's history, the little that I know of it. So these two poems reflect that a bit. This is called The Shrine. My grandfather, three decades dead, speaks to me from inside the picture frame, or tries to. There's no words, just lips bared over teeth, the grin of a man being sliced open without anesthetic. His photograph still stands in the shrine at the back of your house, behind the bowl of wrinkled oranges, under the Chinese character shaped like a pagoda hammered in gold. His name was Pak Wo, and you say it was a curse from birth that he carried misery on his back like a donkey, 
12 hungry mouths and a raging wife waiting for him at the threshold of his apartment after days spent hawking fountain pens. In my memory, he is black and white, like a photograph from another century. Wears a wool suit, wire-framed glasses. He smells of ink and camphor, chrysanthemum tea, and a battered steamer trunk that made the voyage overseas from China. Now his grandchildren, my cousins, are scattered across North America. The dutiful ones are church-going, married, or in university, earning degrees in law, engineering, and pharmacy. One committed suicide this year, swallowing pill after pill until the lovely chill unfolded like a flower through her limbs in the Texas heat. Some days I know I'm losing my way, and grandfather's the one I want to interrogate. I want to hear the whole story to trace the poison back to its source, the blot of black ink curdling in my veins. Last night I dreamt of a storm, snow poured from the milk sky. I shuffled in plastic slippers, the heels peeling away. In one hand, I carried a live chicken, its bony feet hooked between my fingers, a gift for Pak Wo and his starving family. The other poem I'm going to read is, um, I was born in Vancouver, and I've only spent about three days in Hong Kong, courtesy of the Hong Kong Writers' Festival. Um, sometimes that's the only way we writers get to travel, and we're very fortunate that way. But it made, those few days made a huge impression on me, and the poem that came out of it was this, Hong Kong. On Lama Island, you were full of yellow wine. At dinner, a tipsy poet proposed marriage when you said, I'm good with money. Years of poverty had made you frugal, a trait more desirable, finally, than looks or charm. Cockroaches skittered along the dock between the tanks of dying fish. He forgot his own wife was younger than you, that he already had what others wanted. You felt visible again, the night edged with risk. Somewhere out there were opium dens, dragons, the bloated hulls of yachts at the Aberdeen Marina. This was almost the city of your birth. Refrigerated shopping malls with luxury goods and skin lightening creams, butcher's alleys where blood and meat juice sluiced into the gutters. Returning, the junk stalled in the sea. Blue and emerald shapes of land loomed out of the black silk night, the quiet. Suddenly you wanted to cry, thinking of the toy sailboats motoring the pond in Victoria Park, caged birds chirping among the palms. The library where your father studied as a young man, climbing the stone steps with his satchel of engineering books, numbers crowding his head the way words would crowd yours all your life. The ghost of your dead aunt rushing into traffic, double-decker buses and blaring cars, hurrying for home. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. Um, now we have Carrie Ann Liang. She is a fiction writer and educator. Carrie Ann has a PhD in sociology and equity studies from the University of Toronto. Her debut novel, The Wondrous Wu, was shortlisted for a Toronto Book Award. Her collection of linked stories, That Time I Loved You, was released in March 2018 by HarperCollins Canada. That Time I Love You has been nominated for the Toronto Book Award for 2018. So let us give a warm Vancouver welcome to Carrie Ann Leung. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Is that okay? Thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me here. I'm from Toronto, so it's always a pleasure to come to Vancouver. Um, so my book, That Time I Loved You, is a set of linked stories. There's 10 stories set in Scarborough, which is a suburb of Toronto in 1979. 
And today I'm going to read you a story um, from the point of view of a character named June, who's 11 years old, a Chinese Canadian girl. Uh, the story, the set of stories begin with a cluster of suicides that happened in this one neighborhood. And as this is happening, uh, June is also in love for the first time. And this story is called Wheels. The year after all those parents killed themselves, something equally earth-shattering happened. I fell in love. Kaboom. My mother had warned me it would happen, saying, June, wait until you're head over heels for a boy. She said head over heels a lot. Mom was also head over heels for Kentucky Fried Chicken, so I never gave it much thought. <laughs> I didn't know when or why I first noticed him. He had always been there on the street, but it just sort of happened. Bruce belonged to the Wong family. He was two years older, and he hung out with Josie's brother, Tim, so even though his house was on one of the other sister streets, he was on mine almost every day. Before the day I got hit or struck or smitten or whatever you want to call it, I only knew him to be one of the older boys who played hard and fast and high-fived each other and told jokes that made them bend over with laughter. I thought these jokes must have been very dirty. They did not put up with the younger kids stupid enough not to be able to catch a fly ball or not strong enough to break through the human chain of British Bulldog. They yelled at you and let you know that you sucked, but you couldn't cry. You had to be tough. Get up off your bum and get back in the game. If you played well, they'd maybe rub you on the head like a puppy and mutter, nice going. Josie lived for those nice going moments. As for me, I stayed as far away from them as I could because their insults and their compliments equally made me nervous. But then that day happened when he was really there in a whole new way, suddenly so bright I couldn't help but see him. He rode by me too close on his bike, the wind snapping at his black hair like a kite. I felt the gust as he shot by and I turned to look. He's riding, standing up, pumping at his pedals, chasing another kid on a bike. He was laughing, and the sound of it surprised me because it sounded like it belonged to a man and not a child. In a moment, he rode past me, and I could only stare as if seeing him for the first time. His eyes were squinted toward the sun. His skin was golden in his mouth. I noticed his lips, especially his lower lip, plump like a bee had stung it, and my breath caught. I had never thought of boys as beautiful before, but I realized that he was. On someone's porch, a giant boombox was playing Blondie. The song was but a heart made of glass. They played this song so much on 1050 Chum that I knew every word, but I'd always thought it was a weird song. Until that moment, I finally got it. I felt like my heart really would fall out and shatter on the road if he, had, if he didn't look at me. He didn't, not that day anyway, and Debbie Harry's sleepy voice reminded me of how bonkers I suddenly <coughs> felt. But it did happen, maybe the next day or the one after that, or maybe I gradually appeared to him, emerging from the shadows as a girl-shaped thing. I was only a shred of a pre-woman in training, ponytailed with dirt under my nails, wearing slightly pink tube socks because my mom was always too distracted to separate the colors from the whites. Bruce had a bronze 10-speed wrapped with silver, gold, and white stripes. He was with it so much, it was as if the bike were an extension of his body. My parents wouldn't let me get a 10-speed, and I felt like a baby on my powder blue Schwinn with its Madonna seat and plastic orange ribbons trailing from the handlebars. He could pop wheelies into the air, lifting the front wheels off the asphalt like it was nothing. He reminded me of a sparrow ready to take flight as his bike glinted in the sunlight. I remember the other kids cheering and screaming, again, again. I was one of the ones clapping, the short one in the back with my rabbit heart hopping. I tried to pop a wheelie after I saw him do it, but fell, the asphalt taking a few layers off my knee. I never tried it again, but hung back and watched. Thank you. Thank you, Kiria. Um, Alice Poon is going to read for us next. She is a writer based in Richmond, BC, who recently published her first novel, a historical novel, called The Green Phoenix. Alex, Alice was born and educated in Hong Kong and grew up reading Jing Yong's martial arts and chivalry novels, all set in China's distant past, sparking a lifelong interest in Chinese history. 
The Green Phoenix, set in 17th century China, was released in September 2017 by Earnshaw Books. Alice is also the author of Land and the Ruling Class in Hong Kong, which won the 2011 Hong Kong Book Prize and the Canadian Book Review Annual selected the original English edition of the book as an editor's choice in 2007. So please welcome Alice. Thank you for having me. Um, the Green Phoenix is about the life, uh, life story of um, Empress Cao Zhang. Um, she was the first empress of the Qing Dynasty. And um, she's an important historical character because um, she wielded immense influence um, on the reigns of her son, Shenzi Emperor, and her grandson, the Kangxi Emperor. And um, maybe um, a lot of you would know that Kangxi Emperor is one of the uh, most liberal-minded and uh, benevolent emperor uh, in China's history. Um, without uh, Empress Xiao Zhang's uh, charismatic and compassionate leadership, uh, the fledgling Qing Empire would, would not have survived. And uh, the subsequent golden era of the Kangxi and the Qianlong reign uh, would not happen. Uh, this passage that I'm going to read is from chapter three of the novel. Um, the setting is on the Mongolian steppe within the Borjigit clan's family compound. Uh, the scene is where Bumbutai, Bumbutai is the young Empress Cao Zhang, where, where she is preparing to dance a Mongolian waltz with her brother to entertain two guests, Hong Taiji and his half-brother Dorgan. The previous day, she met these two Jurchen princes for the first time. Wu Kashan was Bumbutai's dancing partner. This had a somewhat calming effect on her, although her heart was still thumping wildly. They had done this Mongolian walls many times before in front of guests and had always won big applause from the audiences. Mounted on their separate horses now, they started circling each other in a three-step cadence, timed to a traditional song played by a band of musicians strumming on the horse head fiddles. The steps would pick up speed with the progress of music. With a silky hair woven into two loose plates and each tied at the end with a purple ribbon and dressed in her flowing green skirt and black velvet vest over a purple felt tunic, she looked deliciously attractive. Her elegant poise on horseback had an air that dripped dewy freshness. Her every movement, be it the choreographed swinging of her slender arms or rhythmic clapping of her hands, was exquisitely, exquisitely graceful and in sync with Jergo's steps, which matched those of Wukasan's stallion. It gripped the audience's attention as the horse's steps gathered pace. The sweet blossoming smile never left her face during the entire dance. Aware of where Dorgan was seated, she uncontrollably threw him glances whenever her posture allowed it. As the dance progressed, she saw Dorgan craning his neck to follow her. But something kept distracting her. Hong Taiji's craving eyes seemed bent on having her pinioned. When the dance came to an end, the bewitched audience broke out in thunderous applause. Having agilely dismounted, Umbutai held her brother's hand and went before the two guests to, to take a gracious bow. <coughs> she looked up and met Dorgan's eyes. They were singing a silent tune of adoration. She blushed, and her shiny dark eyes responded with a flowering, flowering smile. Dorgan rose and stepped up to her, 
handing her an ink drawing of a pair of swallows hovering over a bunch of mountain lilies. Looking intently at the drawing, she was amazed at how very nicely it was, it was done. The birds and flowers almost jumped off the paper. Too overwhelmed for words, she could only manage an awestruck look with slightly parted lips. All this time, Hong Taiji looked on and remained silent with a deadpan face. On Jai, Song's, on Jai Sang's signal, Wu Kashan went up to him and sat down to distract him with conversation. Meanwhile, Bun Butai retreated to a corner to prepare for her Chinese poetry recital. She had chosen a popular lyric poem by the Song Dynasty poet Su Shi, entitled Reminiscing Red Cliffs. The poem was about the life and romance of Zhou Yu, a heroic and chivalrous general from the Three Kingdoms era. In a clear voice, she performed the recital in impeccable Chinese, all the while holding the drawing that Dorgan had just given her. The Greek Yan Si scurries forever east, many an ancient hero buried in its sweep. West of the old forts, they say, was fought Zhou Yu's Battle of Red Cliffs. Rampant cliffs that pierced clouds, angry waves that ripped shores, churning up snowy foam. Such a picturesque country, so full of gallant men in times of old. Thinking of Zhao in that distant past, he must have looked valiant with Xiao Chao, his new bride. Feather fan in hand, hair tied in silk, his enemies crushed to dust as he joked. Such was my dreamy tour. Mock me as maudlin, but I'm just a young white-haired bloke. Life is but a dream. Let me offer wine to the river moon. <coughs> when she finished reciting the poem, Hong Taiji stood up and clapped his hands passionately. And this started a round of applause from the amazed audience. Bumbutai was taken aback by his enthused reaction as she had never imagined that a Jurchen Baylor would understand Chinese poetry. Secretly, she, she sneered, thinking he was probably imagining himself as the charming Zhou Yu. She then looked at Dorgan and was, ama was amused by his puzzled look. The next thing she saw was Hong Taiji whispering something into her grandfather's ear, which made him break into a hearty guffaw. Determined not to let the audience's response bother her, she took her bow with cool poise. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. And the last reader is Vincent Ternita. Vincent was a finalist for the Writers Guild Canada's Diverse Screenwriters Program West in 2012 to 2013, and a second rounder for the Austin Film Festival's Television Spec Script Contest in 2013. When he's not writing for his webcomic, Over the Counter, he's working on short stories and a new screenplay. Vincent lives in Vancouver. Let's welcome Vincent. Okay, let's keep this PG. Um, who is Harry Salcedo? He is uh, East Van Strong. He loves his coffee a bit too much. He also loves his parents, not so much. Um, he likes to swear a lot, and uh, he likes his girls. But um, let's uh, keep this within family, and I will read something from the start of the book about his family. My dad was a two-star Michelin chef, proven by the Photoshop plaque on the kitchen wall at White Rock. I had made it after uh, complimenting his Wagyu steak nilaga. I never understood his fascination for using over-the-top ingredients for peasant dishes. Looks good, pa. It's a masterpiece. My mo mother rocked bejeweled. She was the Justin Wong of tablet games. 
One day I would pack my bags and fly to Vegas and watch my mom on Evo and scream, that's my mom. Are we gonna eat or wait for you? My dad asked my mom, huh? Okay. She put down the tablet, 300,000 more points and she would have made the leaderboard. Let's us pray. I did the sign of the cross and for a moment gave all my being to Bathala, then to Carl Sagan. Once my mom finished her litany, we started eating. Did we pray na? My dad appeared, looked like he was due for a second angio. Oh, right, we did. Pinakbet with shrimp pate and organic squash. There was lobster in the dish. The Whole Foods receipt said it's such. Why would he sub lobster for prawn on pinakbet? Bang, how's your date with Marianne? Or was it Suzanne? There was no date. And if I was dating Leonard Cohen's muses, I'd tell you. Your sister said you had a date. I didn't, I don't think we have anything in common. Bullshit. You have nothing in common with everyone you date, interjected Pops. Oh, oh, your tita told me she met someone who would be good for you. I bet that little tramp just wants a PR card now. Your son's right there. I don't give a shit. He's in his 30s. We should have gotten a boy by now. All the more reason he should not give in to desperation. I checked out the other dishes on the table. Pulled pork adobo. Hmm, maybe I'll be pescatarian today. Oh, too late. Dad already had to add kurubuda slices to his pinak bit. The dryer buzzed. Dad silently wa waited for me at the bus stop while smoking an LD red. The 351 arrived, and just as the moment I got on, they scheduled me for a heart bypass in a few months, I heard him say. Before I could reply, the buzz zoomed away. Oh, thank you, Vincent. Um, if anybody has questions written out on the cards, uh, it's, this is a good time to hand it to uh, the volunteers, and then uh, I will sort through them as they come up. But before uh, I ask those questions, I'm going to ask a question I had uh, prepped these authors to think about before. And if you want to get out something to write with or on, or a device, what I'm going to ask them is to name some essential authors that they would place in the Asian Canadian canon. And I always like to see what other writers are reading and what's influenced them. So I'm sure we'll get a lot of good suggestions. And um, yesterday there was a really long list of books that I now have to read. So today I'm sure I'll add to that list. Uh, if I could ask the authors to um, actually be really slow when you say the names of the uh, writers and their titles, because it's hard for people to catch. Um, and if you don't get what they've said, just feel free to yell out, can you repeat that? Or how do you spell that last name? Or anything like that. OK? So. Again, I will start in alphabetical order and ask for three. <laughs> oh, too bad, right? You thought K was <laughs> K was How safe. Is K the first. I know. <laughs> I've been. It's been good since today. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So three essential authors, Asian Canadian. Um, I do have to say, this woman to my right, oh. <laughs> like, it's not, I wouldn't even say like Asian Canadian, it, just like as a teen growing up in Canada, you came across this book and identified with it. Um, I grew up, I was in high school in the 90s, and you were doing a lot of school tours then. Did I show up in your class? No, but you showed up at my friend's classes, oh. yeah, one in Chilliwack. Uh, was yeah. I high or? <laughs> no, 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 I don't think so. She said it was amazing. It was a tumultuous time. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but oh, I don't, no, um, no, she said it was amazing. So I was very jealous. So it was, it was like that book and also, and then around that time, this is like a film though, uh, a few years later, The Double Happiness came out. Mm. So the, uh, yeah, definitely Evelyn. And then I'll go to Madeline at the back there. <laughs> so, yeah, I was like, I was gonna say, I was, thought it was safe you weren't here <laughs> to embarrass my note, but, but definitely like, um, 
early years of university, uh, Simple Recipes came out and it was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, the description of food really influenced me to write about food, Korean food. Um, so that, for sure, Madeline. Um, and then Fred, uh, Fred Waugh, mm -hmm. you know, he's written like 25 books of poetry. Um, and I love poetry. I mean, I, I think I mainly read poetry. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Oh, awesome. Great choices. So, uh, who's next? Chuck, you have to do I'm some work. I'm also a K, yeah. so I have to. Um, I, my three choices would be uh, Fred Barr's uh, Diamond Grill. Um, I thought there was such a, uh, uh, the way he used the prose to, to talk about his growing up experience. And I, I really enjoy the chapter where he talks about his name, War. And as you know, Fred is uh, one eighth Chinese. Uh, the rest are Swedish and Scottish and whatever. Uh, and yet, he stuck with his name because it came from his grandfather. Um, and I thought about my own son because uh, my son is biracial and his son and, or daughters will be uh, one quarter Chinese, but they're stuck with the name Quan, and mm -hmm. Quan is not, uh, you know, not not quite yet the Smith of Canada. So every time you you go to Air Canada and says, "Oh, my name is Quan," they they would, either they'll make fun of it like they did with Fred Wah. That's that was the story in his chapter about. Uh, so I thought that the way he wrote about it, it was so hilarious that uh, as a as a model for uh, what I would like to write. Uh, the other two are Denise Chong's uh, Concubine Children and Sky Lee's uh, Disappearing Moon Cafe, uh, both because they are based on historical real life uh, of, uh, I think Sky Lee's a little bit more fictionalized, but basically based on a lot of the uh, what's happening to her and ancestors. Uh, and obviously, Denise Chong was uh, based on her, I think, a grandmother who's a, who was a concubine who came to Vancouver. So those are my three choices. Good choices, too. And number three would be Evelyn. Um, I tried to think of three people who might not be, you know, obvious names. Um, of course, Madeline is, is always <laughs> um, up there, but um, I tried to think of three people that you know, um, or maybe a little more emerging or maybe not thought about quite the same way. And um, my colleague and friend, Fiona Tinway Lam, who's a poet, um, really an integral part of, of uh, the literary community here. And she's written some, you know, amazing work. She's, her work has been in Best Canadian Poetry, widely anthologized. Um, has been made into, her poems have been made into video poems, and um, yeah, I think she's written some important poetry that will last. Um, so Fiona. Um, uh, the, the next person I think of, I actually haven't read any of her books, but her journalism I thought was just fierce, Jan Wong. Um, I've always loved writers who come across as fearless. And I always felt, you know, reading her columns, particularly in the 90s, like there was nothing she would not say. And when I met her, she was this very kind of meek, you know, no makeup, little glasses, completely unassuming looking little Chinese woman. I thought, oh my God, you have no idea what <laughs> the power that she has. So I've been impressed by, um, by her journalism. And the book I'm reading right now is Carrie Ann's. So she's actually my third choice. Um, I am blown away by her collection of linked short stories. I have always loved the work of Updike and Cheever, writing about, in their case, white suburban families, affairs, you know, um, sort of the dark heart of the suburbs. And she's doing the same thing with an ethnic twist. So to me, it's incredibly, she's taking sort of a, you know, something that's become almost a cliche, you know, life in the suburbs. And she is really just, you know, there's a whole lot of energy there that is really new. And I'm just totally in love with her book. So <laughs> carry on. Great. All right. Super happy. <laughs> 
Well, you know what? You're up next, Karen. Am I up next? Okay. <laughs> Um, the way I interpreted the question, I didn't want to speak about Asian Canada literature because that's so huge and I often feel like that flattens all the differences between all of our histories and the different literatures. So I thought of it as um, Chinese Canadian writers who really influenced and shaped me and showed me what was possible in our literature. So the first book was Skyly's Disappearing Moon Cafe that I ever encountered by a Chinese Canadian. And growing up in Scarborough, I didn't learn the history of Chinese Canada. I didn't even know. I thought I was the pioneer of Canada because I didn't realize there were other Chinese people here, right? And so to understand and to learn through the history as well as the relationship with indigenous communities in her book, it's fictionalized, meant a lot to me. And then, you were always on my list, Evelyn. <laughs> I'm not just saying that because she put me on the list. Turning into like love fest here. <laughs> but reading as a young woman, um, Runaway, it just blew apart the notion of Chinese Canada as a singular story. And to be able to understand myself and other Chinese Canadian women as complicated um, with these incredibly messy stories and lives that cannot be contained really, for me, awakened my own understanding of my life as well as what I could write about. So thank you so much. Um, and Wayson Choi, of course, and the way in which Wayson um, is able to, to write about masculinity, Asian masculinity in the West is so tender and uh, so complicated and beautiful. So those are my mm -hmm. three. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Alice, what do you think? Um, OK. I must admit that I am not that uh, well read in Asian Canadian writing. <laughs> but from my own reading experience, I would select one, uh, Rohinton Mystery, two, Madeleine Tien, and three, Michael Kahn. Um, th these authors all have uh, seminal works uh, of, uh, that are very important, I think. Mystery's a fine balance. Uh, Tien's Do Not Say We Have Nothing, and Kahn's The Water Beetles are all profoundly poignant and inspiring human stories um, that are edged against certain pivotal events in the respective locales. These heart-rending stories not only delve into the respective author's ethnic heritage, but are also likely to leave a lasting imprint on the literary consciousness because they act as alarm bells that forewarn against human, humankind's uh, possible repetition of past mistakes. A fine balance is an important study of humanity and friendship in times of crushing changes. And the story is set in the tumultuous emergency period uh, of India. The novel has a deep sense of realism in it and examines class and gender discrimination with naked honesty. In Do Not Say We Have Nothing, the beauty of friendship is contrasted with the cruelty of betrayal, while the human spirit is seen smothered under wicked oppression in the name of ideology. The author based her multi-generation saga on her stepmother's true experiences in the Cultural Revolution in China. It is a stark reminder of human weaknesses in savage times, but also offers a glimpse of hope in the human quest for spiritual freedom. Um, as for Michael Kahn's The Water Beetles, I have not even read, read it yet, but I'm going to. Uh, but from reviews uh, that I have read, the novel is based entirely on the author's father's memoirs. It is a story about the unspeakable atrocities of the 1941 Japanese invasion of Hong Kong. Uh, I have a personal bias for, for this uh, novel. This novel, uh, because I, I have heard of similar stories uh, from my own relatives about the Japanese invasion. 
and I have, I have also read nonfiction titles about this brutal war. I applaud the author for writing a novel about this particular part of World War II, which is too important to be relegated to oblivion. Thank you. And uh, Vincent, we'll hear your choices. Okay, uh, welcome to my show and tell. Um, these are the books that inspired me throughout my journey and Harry's journey. Uh, just a caveat, Harry and I are not the same person. Um, first one is Gentlemen of the Shade by Jen Suk Fong Lee. Uh, I met her last year at the Literation Festival and I enjoyed this book because of the creative nonfiction and I'm such a big pop fiction, a pop, pop fiction, pop, pop culture addict that um, my private Idaho, Vancouver in the 90s, and the way she wrote it, like presented that zeitgeist that inspired me to write about Vancouver right now. Um, Leanne Dunick's uh, To Love the Coming, uh, Coming End. Um, I am a non linear type of writer and seeing someone doing lyrical prose. Like I've never even heard of lyrical prose until I heard her read last year at Literation. So like I picked up the book and I was going, I was blown away by like her love of Yukio Mishima, um, Yuki Mishima, just the number 11, November. And in bite-sized prose pieces, I was going with such little words, you can, um, transcend that emotional gap, and it really spoke to me. Um, and not just with that, uh, with m just taking your art and just going with it. And um, yeah, and finally, because of the incessant nagging by William, um, Terry Wu's Banana Boys, and he says it's the one book that really reminded him of the Harry Salcedo book. So I'm just going, yeah, um, let's read Banana Boys and see what it's like. And yeah, they're all sad boys. And <laughs> Harry's a sad boy, and I'm a sad boy. So before I start crying, I'm going to stop now and turn back to Julia. <laughs> Thank you, Vincent. And uh, I, I have a note here from Todd. He wants to add to this whole list of uh, Asian writers. So he's got. Paul E, Maddie Tian, uh, Denise Chong, Joy Kagawa, Roy Miki, Rita Wong, Evelyn Lau, uh, Roy Kuyu Kuyuka, Sky Lee, and of course, Fred Wah. So I think we've covered the whole range of writers here. <laughs> okay, I'm going to uh, start with some questions from the audience, but because of a, a remark that uh, Evelyn made earlier, I'm going to ask Janie to ask her question from yesterday, because I think you'll get a different answer. <laughs> the rap, uh, rap press pressure? Oh, they hated me for asking. Yes, I know. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> For the panel. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I know. I know Jamie already. Yeah, no, Jamie, yeah. Jamie's my friend. Um, yes, and I have really resisted that. You know, it took me, and because I was so resistant, it took me a long time to kind of be more, to temper my approach to that. Um, yeah, I've never felt just because you know, oh, you're a woman, you have to, you have a duty and an obligation to write from a feminist perspective, say, or because you're Asian, you have to represent, you know, that, so that was always something I chafed against. Um, you know, it's the whole idea of being told what you're supposed to write. Um, you know, I, I think I've mellowed <laughs> as I've gotten older, and I mean, I love being able to recommend things like this festival and places like Rice Paper to my writing students, for example, who are Asian and typically come from a family for whom, you know, going into the arts is just, you know, you might as well say, oh, I want to be a prostitute or something, you know, the parents are not going to support it. Um, so, 
you know, I'm so grateful that there are, you know, that there are Asians who are in the arts, who are supporting each other and supporting younger, you know, emerging people. And I think that is really valuable. At the same time, I think it is important that, you know, you, you find your own voice and it may not be the voice um, that your community wants you to have. And that's, that should still be okay. These days, with the there are quite a few controversies. Uh, uh, if anybody else uh, mm -hmm. wants to jump in with their thoughts on the previous question about pressure, before I move on, um, please feel free. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any comments? Hi. Uh, oh, I, I knew carry. <laughs> <laughs> Go carry on. All right, Janie. <laughs> I'll try to satisfy. Um, I don't feel the pressure. I feel that. There's, it's such a complicated conversation, right? And I don't feel the, the pressure to represent a racial identity or a racial community. I feel very protective um, growing up, having um, you know experienced a lot of the kind of racism that was around in the 70s and feeling very protective of the ways in which um, we are portrayed in popular culture and the media and so forth. Of course, I'm protective of that. But I honestly, like I, I write for myself first. And, um, and for me, I think that inherent in my voice, whether I write about identity or explicitly say that I am writing about issues that are whatever, that are Chinese, it comes out in my voice, right? But that doesn't mean that that's the only thing that I write about. Um, and that's also what I refer to with Evelyn's book, Runaway, and other women, mm -hmm. that we can write about all kinds of things. It doesn't always have to come back to identity or, or and I don't know if that then feels like I'm not representing um, a racial community or not, but um, it's fraught. Like, I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. That's not really an answer, but that's what I got. Okay, yeah. thank you. And Chuck? I, I have another perspective on this, uh, d just because of the kind of work that I do. Um, I, I make documentary films about the Chinese diaspora. So when I talk about the story, it's a universal story. You know, it's, it's emotion, it's immigration, it's marriage, uh, your kid's marriage, and all this stuff. Um, but I don't feel I, I'm able to do anything else other than Chinese because of my background. I, I'll be foolish to go make a series on Indian restaurants without being informed of the whole cultural and, uh, and ancestral and historical uh, background of being an Indian. I would not be able to talk about how I talk about. Like uh, in, in my Cuba episode, um, and, and actually I want to thank Carrie Ann Leung. <laughs> many, many years ago, she, she did the research for me for Cuba. Um, and she handed me a nine-page notes of everything she found about Cuba, and I, I was fall, I've been writing based on her notes <laughs> since, ever since then. So thank you, Carrie Ann. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, you know, like the notes that Carrie Ann handed me are are like um, a short form of sort of there's a reference like. Because she's Chinese, I'm Chinese, so she can talk about things Chinese without having to explain what it is. And, and, and that's how I feel when I make my film, because uh, you know, I talk about uh, Guan, Gong, uh, Guan Gong Temple in, in Cuba, right? Uh, somebody who's non-Chinese would not know what Guan Gong, who Guan Gong is and how to explain how, how he came about, but I could. Uh, so I, I felt that you know, I would not have, if I was uh, non-Chinese, I would not have been able to do justice to, so, so say, the Cuban diasporic story. Uh, so in that sense, I'm kind of the other way around, putting my pressure on myself to make sure that I'm authentic or, or true to the, the topic I'm talking about. <laughs> it's also interesting, though, like, you, you write, but you don't expect the kind of resonances people that you don't think of as being in your communities have with your work, mm -hmm. right? So I think there's the writing, but there's also reading. That's a very different process of how um, you see yourself in a text or not, right? 
Yeah, um, I'd like to add to this. Uh, so like I'm Hapa, I'm half Korean, and I went to French school, like French immersion. So I wrote this book for myself and, and you know, things come, you know, there are Korean elements to it and, you know, French sentences. And I, I talked to the editors and I didn't want anything italicized, right? Like I didn't want bulgogi or namul italicized. I just wanted everything to blend and they were, totally on board with that, and that was wonderful. Um, so I just wrote this from my heart, and then the thing is kind of different when you're writing and your audience is like preteens. So I'm going out to schools, and it, like I was in the States, in the Bronx, um, and it was 76 girls, and there was one white girl, and there were a lot of African-American Chinese mix, mm -hmm. Hispanic and Korean, and they could identify with this book. And so that does, like, I'm like, oh, whoa, like, it's important that these kids, like, see characters that are like them mm -hmm. in literature. And that did give a little bit of a pressure, but it's good, right? Like, I'm fine with it, yeah. um, with doing that. So, yeah. Uh, I said something about overrepresentation yesterday, but um, as, like I progressed to this festival and then my own journey and looking back at reading the, like writing this novel, I've always like pushed forward and then held back. And then it's like, am I gonna offend someone or am I gonna offend myself? But then I realized I'm offensive altogether. So like, <laughs> it's gonna be something anyway. So I just wrote what it is. And um, I had a conversation with the reviewer of my book, uh, Carlo Javier. Um, how he's saying it breaks a lot of stereotypes of um, Filipino men um, that we're not just janitors or we're not just laborers or we're not just th this type of stereotype. And that's what I was trying to, um, after a while, after finishing the book, I was going, yeah, like, um, I don't want to be this stereotype. I don't want to, like, um, I want to represent, like, there can be another form of Filipino men being represented as a such. He can be a short dude just drinking coffee and doing his East Van thing, and that's okay. And I think that's okay. And if I offended someone, sorry. Thank you. So uh, related to this topic is the recent cultural appropriation controversies. Has that affected any of your writing? Feel free to jump in if you have any thoughts. I, my book, um, so I have 10 stories, and they're not all from Chinese-Canadian point of views. And um, I've, I've thought a lot about the appropriation um, issue, and I think, you know, rightly so, we need to think about the ethics of our positions as writers. Whose story can we tell and whose, you know, we shouldn't. And I think it does come to, um, a thinking through about what are the ethics and what is our roles and what is our responsibility to story and to people. Um, and I feel and I hope, and I was very nervous when the book came out in terms of whether someone would actually say, you have no right to tell the story of a Portuguese woman committing suicide in the 70s, right? That's not your story to tell. So it's that kind of proximity. I am i don't know if there's ever a right or wrong um, answer to that, but I think that it requires a lot of thinking through, a lot of risk taking, and a lot of um, accountability to the people and the stories that you want to write about. Anybody else? Well, I think, I mean, appropriation has been a subject since the 90s, um, and various writers have been accused of it. You know, this kind of thing I, I find really difficult because you know, um, as writers, I mean, writing is hard, right? You know, I mean, it's, we don't do it gratuitously. I mean, we agonize over every word anyway. Um, and my concern with this, you know, latest round of everybody tying themselves up in knots over appropriation is that it, the self-censorship will grow as a result of it. We're already so anxious when we write and we face that blank screen or that blank page. We're already second-guessing ourselves. You know, who are we going to offend if a character, you know, 
or a story might be based on something that happened with a, you know, a partner or a family member or something, you know, is that person going to not talk to us for the rest of our lives? And then, so when we add on top of that, and of course, you know, many of us write from out of personal experience, we write what we know. Um, but that can be universal too, you know? I mean, there are certain emotions that are not, you know, based on race or gender or whatever. Um, and I just, I get really concerned when I start thinking about um, the many writers perhaps who are shutting themselves down out of worrying about offending somebody. Because as you know, Vincent was saying, yeah, I mean, <laughs> You know, we're going to offend people. I mean, you just you just have to kind of start from that as a base level, and you know, go from there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Uh, just to add on to that, um, on our beta reading stage, I we I had to heavily woke check my book uh, because um, it is a story about a philanderer, so with infidelity. So I'm just wondering. Um, like my biggest fear was like it, it was written heavily during the Me Too movement, and like is this still a type of genre that I should be pursuing? Like I I just talked to William a lot about it. Like I had a lot of concerns. Um, I'm trying to explore that masculinity aspect. Is it like um, can I still do that? Can I still do that in this Me Too era? And then William said it's okay. And a lot of my um, better readers were women and they're saying like you, you treated women with respect with your book like you were very fair you were very fair to the character story and um but i still had doubts i was going yeah like um maybe it'll come for am i gonna have someone come forward and accuse me of something but then like yeah just have that courage to um know what's good know what's appropriate and uh, for the piece and um just i wrote from the heart and um, I think that's cliche. But um, yeah, I wrote from the heart and went with that. And I said, like, this is my truth. This is Harry's truth. We're going to show it to the world. And cross your fingers. Thank you. Any more thoughts on this topic before I move on? Um, I'd just like to share uh, a quote from uh, Mr. Kazuo Ishiguro's uh, 2017 Nobel Lecture. Um, in the final part of the, his speech, he uh, made an appeal for diversity in literature and breaking down of barriers. This is what he said. Firstly, we must widen our common literary world to include many more voices from beyond our comfort zones of the elite first world cultures. Second, we must take great care not to set too narrowly or conservatively our definitions of what constitutes good literature. The next generation will come with all sorts of new, sometimes bewildering ways to tell important and wonderful stories. We must keep our minds open to them, especially regarding genre and form, so that we can nurture and celebrate the best of them. Good writing and good reading <laughs> will break down barriers. We may even find a new idea, a great humane vision among, uh, around which to rally." End of quote. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Okay, so following up on that, there's a question about how do you balance your writing with maintaining relationships when your writing may portray these people in a negative light? <laughs> Feel free to jump in. Well, I describe case. them as uh, handsome or beautiful. So like when they see themselves, oh, at least I'm good looking. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I may be a jerk, but at least I'm good looking. It's, yeah, <laughs> appeal to the vanity. It, <laughs> it does help. No. Well, it helps to enjoy one's solitude, for sure, um, <laughs> and to prize that above relationships. Because, um, I mean, I've been estranged from my family since I was 14, so. Um, and, I mean, I'm somebody for whom writing has always come first, frankly. So that has not been, in some ways, a sacrifice. 
Um, it depends what you value most. Um, I have never shown works in progress to friends or partners um, who are portrayed. I have shown them after they've been published, and I've said, you know, here it is, and I understand if, you know, if um, this, if you no longer want to have anything to do with me, basically. <laughs> um, and it's sort of up to them. But it's interesting how, I think for most people, you cannot <laughs> predict how anybody is going to react. And there are times when I have written something that's clearly based on something that has happened, where I felt certain the person would be offended. And instead, they were flattered that I had, that they'd been important enough in some way that I had crafted, you know, an entire poem or story about them. And other times, I've written something that has been, you know, barely, I mean, you know, really insignificant. And somebody has um, taken that to heart and been very upset by that. So, you, again, you can't tie yourself up in knots anticipating someone's reaction because it will likely not be the one that you're expecting. Yes, um, I, I think Denise Chong two years ago in her, in her workshop talked about writing of a concubine's children where she's exposing a lot of family secrets and she was gingerly very scared about you know approaching her aunt or her um, relatives about can I talk about this can I talk about that and I think she she overcome that somehow uh, but the scar is, is uh, still there I have, uh, s s just as Evelyn said about showing your work to, to other people, um, I had the one issue when I was making my film, I had a film and interview with a, a woman from, uh, she's a Hong Kong immigrant to marry into Trinidad. Um, and then she talks about, you know, I, I still think Hong Kong is my home. You know, I don't like this place and this and that. So. I put that in to be authentic, but then, of course, when she saw it, saw the rough cut, she said, "No, no, no, no." Or children saw it. It's no, 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 no. Mom would never say that. You know, take it out, take it out. It'll make us look bad because you know they're trying to be Trinidadian citizens, and here is their mother talking about, "Well, I'm still a Hong Kong person." You know, that kind of thing, right? So, um, in my Argentina chapter right now, I'm I'm really, really worried about not about showing it to the, the people I wrote, I wrote about, because I'm afraid, because there I expose a few things of family secrets and, you know, uh, a relationship that normally would not, you, you would not write about unless you're doing the truth, right? So in that sense, I, I, I'm, I'm with Ellen. I, I'm not gonna even show them until it's published and nothing can be changed. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? My alibi is I'm a fiction writer. <laughs> so everything's fiction. So, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? No? OK, I, I'm going to jump in here, even though I'm not on the panel, because I find this very irritating. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I just I just wrote uh, I published a, a nonfiction book and it really galled me that I had to cut so much of the truth because the person I was writing about is still alive and I just felt like okay I I, ha I have to honor them because they're my elder and I really don't want to cut this relationship off forever. So, but you know, as a writer, I think it's our job to tell the truth. Why do we write? We want to tell, the, to be honest and to portray the world as is without glossing things over. So, uh, sorry for jumping in there. <laughs> Oh, that's good. And I mean, I think, you know, certainly other writers know, I don't know if the public knows, but it is our truth. You know, when we say the truth, it sounds a bit too grand. I mean, it's yeah. our version, it's our experience. And you know what they say about how, you know, five people watch a car accident, they go away with five different versions of it, right? Of course, that is going to be true. And it's, it's what's true to the story, to what the story needs. And likewise, I mean, my nonfiction has been mutilated. Um, you know, by editors, lawyers, etc. And then afterwards, you think, you know, then it gets the book review will be uh, will be published, and they'll say, oh, you know, this was this was a terrible piece of work because it had no detail, etc. I think the detail was there; it got 
cropped, right? So you almost wonder, you know, when that kind of thing starts happening, it's like, is it worth it? Should I, you know, do you feel that your, your piece is now just sort of a shadow of what it was? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you thought of maybe not publishing it as a result? It's done, it's out okay. there. Okay. So um, it's fine. I do respect their reasons for not wanting to divulge um, parts of their lives, mm -hmm. and it is their story. And um, the reason I wrote it was to tell their story, mm. not my story, okay. right? My version of their story. <laughs> so, um, but you know, the 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 way people view themselves and the way they want to be portrayed is um, sometimes I just think, you know, you're 86. It's okay to tell the <laughs> truth now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay, let's move on to a writing question um, for everybody. Uh, says, where do you write and where do you do your best thinking? What's your creative writing routine? Anybody want to share your s secrets with us? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Should we go back to controversies? Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll start, um, even though I've written one book. But um, so the first step is I just sort of look at something and space out and just stare at it and break it down and describe something. And I write it down on a notepad. Like I might look at the way the light hits something. Um, and then I just do that randomly all day. <laughs> and then the next part is I sit down at my computer and then I feel like I just meditate. Like I, I create a space and I just sort of write whatever's coming through me. And then I'll also type down what I was spacing out on, whatever's in my notepad. And then I try to put it all together <laughs> into a story. Um, what I did was I had a really hard time because my book's all in vignettes and I don't, I'm not very linear, so it was hard for people to read or um, hard for people to understand. I understood it, but um, so what I did was I actually placed film, film structure on it. The three acts of a film, the certain beats, opening scene, uh, you know, uh, the setup. Uh, there's a book called Save the Cat, which is um, a very formulaic, it's like how to create a f like a formulaic Hollywood film. And their big example in there is Legally Blonde, which has like all the beats. So I put that on top, I placed that on top of my randomness and it worked out finally. Um, there's some structure now you can see, uh, you know, and yeah, that's what I did, so. Well, that's interesting, Michelle, because it's almost, you know, what you're talking about, the, um, you know, looking at the way the light slants yeah. on the page, meditating, yeah. the vignette approach. It's like the approach to poetry yeah. in so many ways, yeah. you know, it's that, it's just that small moment yeah. or, you know, that sparks something. And it's a lot of kind of going inward and thinking and sitting with something and walking, you know, I mean, walking is so important. And for me, I mean, we live in a time where everybody is constantly distracted and I really limit that by, you know, not having a cell phone, not having Wi-Fi in my apartment. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, all I can do is stare out the window. <laughs> I've got nothing else better to do. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's a lot of trying to find that inner space and clearing out the clutter mm. and of course we all have busy lives and other obligations and that can sometimes really be very intrusive when you're just trying to get into the space that is conducive for writing. Coffee, a lot of coffee, um, but not too much or the anxiety will kick in and then you start writing something else. Um, I usually choose my favorite coffee shop at the moment. The one, um, I, it's summer, so I go to Palette because it's like a 20 minute walk. Um, if it's winter, it's gonna be the Starbucks so that I can like get my act together because it's such bad coffee. Um, you just wanna get it done, get it out of here. Um, alcohol, 
that works too. Um, that's more for the inspiration, but I won't recommend it to anyone. Um, but yeah, like alcohol, coffee, you just go back and forth until I get something done. But yeah, I also do um, a lot of screen, like screenplay techniques. I usually write a treatment, and once I write the treatment, um, I ended up writing a short story. And once I have that short story, I go like, um, does this story evolve into a longer form? Does it have legs? And that's when I start uh, shamelessly showing it off to William. Um, if not William, someone else. Sorry, William. Um, he's really awesome. When, once you find an editor, uh, like just marry them or um, <laughs> just, just be with them. They're, they're just the best. Thanks. Thank you. Here you I don't have, um, I'm not one of those writers who, who can write every single day. Um, I, I have. I have a child, I have to make a living, and so I just write when I can, which is sometimes, you know, on a commute, on a bus, uh, in a coffee shop, in line for coffee. Um, but writing um, fiction, uh, when I get into a story, I really feel quite haunted by the characters. So even if I'm not physically writing, I feel like they're with me all the time. Um, and then that's kind of that magic that happens when the world starts opening up with a different set of eyes and you kind of inhabit your character. So even when I'm not writing writing, I'm always kind of with them and with the stories. And I've also had, I really love um, motels. <laughs> like I love blank spaces where it has no like sign of your life whatsoever, you know? So I've gone on like Hotwire or Priceline and I've booked like stays where I just go and shut myself up in a hotel or a motel and I just write. I bring lots of chips because that seems to help and, um, and I just kind of shut everything out and I just do these like spurts of writing that um, I have so much fun. People might think like who's staying in the next room might think like what the hell is going on in that room because I'm laughing, I'm crying and having a really good time. <laughs> Um, well, I am a historical novelist, and uh, before I sit down to write, I do a lot of research. And it's, it is often during the, my research that um, the structure of the story begins to form in my mind. Um, so uh, when I s sit down and start to write, um, I make it a routine. Um, uh, I write every day from Monday to Thursday, <laughs> from nine to three. So I force myself to write um, at that time. <laughs> um, sometimes uh, the inspiration comes uh, as the story uh, gets carry carried along. Uh, and um, that's it. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, everybody. It's been a great session, and um, thank, thank you for the questions from the audience. And we will say goodbye to our panelists. So thank you very much. Do you want to say anything else? Just one final housekeeping item, everyone. If you want to buy books, we still have books and, of course, our limited edition uh, rice paper and literation t-shirts as well at the Sunwa Center.